I am delighted to be here today with Neil DeGrade, who has made the beautiful film Queen of the Night. Thank you. watched it twice now because I am not um, I'm not a symbolist by any means and uh, trying to to delve into the symbolism of that movie has been um, quite challenging for me um, I I had one thought when I watched the movie and I thought maybe that's what he's getting at so we'll we'll get to that later nice <laughs> but but um I wondered if you could tell us a little bit about yourself, your background, how you got into filmmaking and the music side of things. And um, and also, um, what kind of moved you to make this film? Yeah, OK, that's a, a lot there. So uh, basically, I grew up in a family of entertainers. Uh, my father was a radio broadcaster. He was very uh, popular in the area I grew up in, in southern New England. And uh, oddly enough, his his father and my mother's father were also in broadcasting. So uh, I was kind of, it's, I was like kind of supposed to be aiming at, I think at a, as, at a broadcasting career at some point, but instead my parents, uh, when I was young, they made me take music lessons and I hated it at first. I wanted to be a visual artist. I loved drawing. I loved animating. And, uh, but they said, you know, they're going to force me to do it. And they said they'll that I'll thank them someday. And so I'm I'm here basically on this podcast to thank my parents for making me take music lessons. <laughs> um, no, but it, all, all seriousness, uh, it really caught on when I was a teenager. It helped like me form an identity um, and different reasons. Like so I, I saw it as a way to sort of be liked and admired um, as well as something that I loved. Uh, but as I got older, I saw it less as something that I was using to add value to myself and maybe a way to interact and add value to a community in the world. So um, I've been doing music and I, I was always filmmaking when I was a teenager with all my friends. Like we would, we made a lot of Kung Fu movies and zombie movies and and things like that when I was in high school. And so this has always been part of my uh, my path. Now, when I was 22 years old, I was cast as a lead in a musical and uh, I was living in Providence, Rhode Island, and uh, my wife was cast before me um, on the West Coast. And the director and the casting team cast us because they thought we would have wonderful chemistry and we'd go together. And the writer of the musical said, yeah, you're probably going to marry this girl. And it turned out that he was right. So we met in a musical and we instantly started doing music together. She was she already had kind of a music career going. I was a little bit of a pauper. I don't know if you ever heard the song uh, by Paul Simon, Diamonds on the Soles of Her Shoes. Um, it's really our story in a way. Um, so we um, we oh, met. Okay. Some... Slow down. Slow okay. down a second. Right. First of all, what was the theme? What was the plot of the musical? <laughs> oh, the musical was called Rage of the Heart. So if you're familiar with an uh 12th century philosopher in France uh, named uh, Peter Abelard. Uh, I was cast as Peter Abelard and she was cast as Eloise. And so, um, so Abelard was at the time he was supposed to be celibate like theologian and he fell in love with one of his students. Uh, her, she, I think she was 17 or something like that, which was less scandalous in the 12th century. But of course it was the scandal was all in the fact that he was supposed to remain celibate as a theologian. And uh, they they fell in love and they were separated and they, they wrote a, uh, a number of letters back and forth. She was sent to a nunnery and I think he spent his time in a monastery after that. So um, that was the story uh, we were cast at. I never actually was in the musical. We met. Um, I dropped out of the musical very early on. Uh, I didn't want to be in a musical. I auditioned accidentally, like sort of accidentally. I was hitching a ride from a friend who was auditioning and uh because I didn't really want to be in it, I think I auditioned very well. Like I had zero nerves and I was just trying to crack people up. 
that were there and they you know called me back and much to my surprise they wanted me to do the lead um so i think i overperformed in it now kate's like a real real actress real singer she's she plays the queen and queen of the night so i was out of my league as far as trying to perform and sing next to her so um but we hit it off pretty quickly and uh, we started a music career. And so we've been doing the band Derpo Robin since uh, I think we started in 2004. Um, and so that's been our full time gig for the last few years. I've done a lot of other production for other things and, and uh, scoring work like film scoring, scoring for television, scoring for podcasts. And so pretty much outside of a few exceptions, I've only been working on our own art for the past few years. And so oh, it's uh, that dirt poor robins. Do you 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 perform in venues or just oh uh, no, thank God. Not anymore. No, so once we once we started having kids, it kind of became impossible. Like um our youngest, our our oldest daughter, sorry, she liked being on the road. She liked going to new hotels and swimming pools and stuff, and she was like only two years old at the time. But by the time we had a second kid, we we're like, no, this is this is we're not gonna do that to them. Like our my my role as a husband and a dad was way more important to me and her role as a mom was way more important to her than like ever the idea of becoming a star. We weren't really allured by the idea of fame. Like I, I saw that as problematic. I, I luckily I'd been around a lot of like highly famous people in that point and worked with them. And I knew it was something I didn't want, but at the same time, there's a, there's a consequence to like, if you want to make art and you want to get it out there. And especially if you think your art is good for the world, like in any capacity, um, you have to endure a little of that at least. So we've been able to remain pretty, pretty anonymous while we've built a, a career for ourselves. So that's been good. Um, but yeah, so that was something we weren't going to do. I miss performing in a way, but I also don't miss like carrying all this stuff around with me, you know, in uh, trekking around the country into other countries. So I don't miss that part of it all, but I miss interacting with uh, people in person and fans and, and the energy you get when you perform live. That's pretty, that's pretty awesome. So you've been able to, continue your music simply through the sales of your material yeah it's hard now so like what happened in music is the middle class kind of disappeared um it's it's very hard to be middle class musician that's what i would consider myself um because uh streaming and cd sales so like with the with the type of numbers we have now if we were selling cds like we'd have gold plated hot tubs and uh you know it, it'd be it'd be really lucrative but, you know, when you're getting 0 0.03 cents to 0 0.05 cents per stream, you, you got to get into the millions before you have enough money every month to, uh, you know, support yourself. So we license our music sometimes. We sell T-shirts. We have a Patreon um, where people support us. And and that's been then a, enough to keep it going because the dream for me was always uh, financially was just to be able to keep making art. Like I didn't I didn't want the distractions of uh, wild, wild success. And I just uh, everything, everything I was doing was so I get to keep making art, keep making art. So, um, yeah, so that's really hard for musicians. So really, uh, well, I, I just have to say, I think it's hard for all artists. Because, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's a different problem for painters. Um, but for for painters, the middle class painters, if, mm -hmm. if you're not discovered by Jay Leno or something like that, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, you're dependent on the people that you can reach with your work. And, and it's bought by one person unless you want to license it and put it on T-shirts or something. And that was never a direction that I wanted to go. So mm -hmm. um, so you're kind of limited as to how many people yeah. you can reach. And um, yeah, so I think it's a common problem you know, thankfully, I was able to sell enough work that I could pay for my own expenses, like, you know, take pay for the classes that I wanted to take, pay for my materials, buy enough canvases, have a little left over for things I wanted to do. But but as far as making a living at it, I think the only way to do it would be with Patreon and exactly shirts and all that kind of thing. Yeah. Well, otherwise, so the other people I know that do it full time um, that don't have as big of an audience, they they teach lessons. They give lessons. Um, mm -hmm. and, and that's a great way to do it. I just don't have the patience for it. I don't remember how I learned what I learned. I don't think about what I know anymore. I just do my job and I expand my knowledge. But it's, it's weird because like I, I work almost entirely on intuition and flow at this point. Uh, so people ask me to describe my process or what I'm doing, and sometimes it's very difficult. I'm trying to reverse engineer what actually happened because it's I I, I kind of stay in this kind of flow intuitive state uh, when I'm working and creating. So uh, that's difficult. Well, I want to talk about that a little bit more when we get uh, towards the end. So maybe sure. you you can't uh, you can't remember these things, but I want to dig your, dig into your thought process a little bit. Um, 
in relation to one of my pet interests is how the different uh, bodies of knowledge connect to each other through what I think of as the elements and principles that govern the making of art. So mm. I think it would be fun to kind of compare notes on that. Well, it sounds like I'm going to learn something today. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm in. I'm down. <laughs> Well, I mean, I'm going to learn something for sure. So <laughs> I, so you're up to um, the point where you are making music with Dirt Poor Robbins and mm -hmm. making a living with Patreon and uh, T-shirts. Now, and now we made a film. So uh, part of what happened when I was younger, I fell in love with concept records. The first record I ever owned, I was in kindergarten. It was a Queen record. Uh, you know, with Freddie Mercury on lead vocals and uh, Brian May on guitar. And it was uh, News of the World. And I love the record and the album cover with this like Isaac Asimov, um, like take on one of his book covers. Uh, it really enraptured me. And then I started getting into like Pink Floyd, The Wall. I had strange tastes as a child. Um, and so I loved concept records. I loved Sgt. Peppers in the 90s. I loved records like um, OK Computer by Radiohead. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but I, as soon as I knew I had chance to make records there was going to be a bigger story at work in that project so i wasn't going to just write typical pop songs i didn't uh i think love is a great thing i think that pop music doesn't really know how to deal with that subject uh, and pop music also has this problem where uh, it has to make an immediate impact so things have to be about hooks and you have to say things that grab people's attention and uh i'm fine with all those things except that it uh, music couldn't just be that for me i wouldn't be satisfied so uh, as soon as my wife and I started making records, we always had a concept behind the record. We'd have a story and uh, the songs would be built around and telling that story. Now, the the concept a lot of times with these records I'm referring to, it's it's more implicit to the audience. The audience doesn't really know the story, but they get the sense that there's a bigger context to it. And so what that did to me as someone who was listening to these records, it opened my mind up to like a, a, a wider world, a bigger set of possibilities. And it, it felt like uh, something more cosmic and transcendent was happening uh, when the music was nested in uh, a larger narrative. So uh, as I went along, um, that was what we did. So we did concept records. And finally, the story I came up with for Queen of the Night, um, I knew it had to be a film. It was it was too. Um, yeah, it was just it was too visual of a story. Uh, and it had too many visual anchors. And I was like, I, I don't think I can tell this in music alone. Simultaneously, I felt like Hollywood is. I think uh, there's something about Hollywood that's dying in a way. I mean, there's still good stuff that comes out, <laughs> yes, but for it, sure, <laughs> it's been so politicized, and and it's it's like the same problem that was happening to me when I was, um, you know, when I became a Christian when I was younger. Is that a lot of the art was just like it was almost propagandistic. It was like forcing the message into it, and it was trying to force a viewpoint from the audience. And I was never into that. And then that same problem when. Uh, when Hollywood got more politicized than before and people were trying to force these narratives into it, you have that same kind of like, Oh, it's like, it's like a public service announcement you're watching for someone's viewpoint. And it's just dead and dry as opposed to someone's trying to expose the mystery of how reality actually works, how we actually live in this world, how we think, how we be um, in this world. So um, I, uh, I was like, okay, I'm going to do, I'm going to make a movie. I love fairy tales. I think fairy tale language is something that's dead. Um, it, to our culture, they don't really understand it. They they like fairy tale characters for cosplay, and even people that make uh, movies like uh, that involve fairy tale characters. They're they're seldom they're uh, it's seldom that they're participating in the actual vocabulary and the uh, zeitgeist of fairy tale world. And more and more so, they're just picking up things like dragons and making dragons your pets now. And it's not a cosmic image anymore. And and so those ideas were lost. And I was like, well, my story's gonna. I don't think like these people do. I think in a much older way. Uh, I'm pretty sure of that. And uh, so I'm like, I'm going to just, I'm going to tell a story. I'm not going to have a, um, I don't really have a message I'm trying to send when I'm coming up with these stories. They just kind of hit me. And how I refer to people is like, they, it's like it shows up like a wounded wild animal. And my job is when I get the idea is to nurse it back to health, but not in a way where it can't go out back into the wild and have a life of its own. So this is part of the reason you might find some of the symbolism in the story opaque it's because I'm not trying to explain it at all. It, I'm trying to 
uh, you know, I'm, I'm trying to make the world feel like a real world of mystery where uh, it's opening a window into a greater reality as opposed to reducing it to something that we can use like a definition or something like that. So I try to leave my art wild. Like I just don't I don't want to tame it too much and I don't want to explain it too much. I do end up explaining a lot of things like I have a discord. People get in there. They ask me questions. And if they pester me long enough, I might give them something here and there. Um, at the same time, there's some other people like, you know, like Jonathan Peugeot or um, uh, Derek Fiedler, who's uh, done some uh, behind the scenes, like breakdowns of my film. And they they seem to get it better than I do. Um, so, you know, I've always found I've always found that about my work, too, that, that other people, people get it better by my work, get it way better than I do. Yeah, you're well, doing they, something similar they, to me, they though. Tell me, they tell me what they tell me what they see. And then I think, well, yes, that that was there all the time, but I just wasn't aware of it. Mm -hmm. Well, you're doing something similar that I tried to do and I've been focusing on recently. Like I was poking around your website and, uh, you know, some of your series like the cellist. Um, I love that you have like a through line, right? There's a through line, but you're playing with uh, like the setting on that around that through line, you know, so like uh, I can almost compare that to like a uh, someone serving dinner. Right. And so they're serving chicken, but chicken's just chicken until like you add marinara and, uh, you know, uh, mozzarella and suddenly I'm in Italy. And, you know, you add uh, you add sweet and sour sauce and I'm in, you know, I'm in Asia somewhere, you know, like so there's things like you can do. And so you're doing that with your artwork. And I'm always playing with that same thing, like with my records. I might it might be a longer, uh, more stretched out project. But I liked when I was looking through your stuff is like you were definitely I felt the similarity in your thoughts, like you're trying to find a, th a through line and you're changing the settings. And uh, you might be doing that intuitively or just uh, naturally, but. Um, yeah, definitely. Uh, it, it made sense to me. I saw a commonality what you're doing. But uh, yeah, maybe we have that same com commonality where I don't I don't always know explicitly what I'm trying to get at. Sometimes I'm trying to solve a problem like that I've been mulling over or just like there's something about culture that's irking me or the fact that I'm bringing kids up into a world that seems to be uh, topsy turvy and, and and swerving everywhere it can on the road. Um, and so I think that sometimes when I'm just mulling over these kind of things, trying to come up with solutions as an artist, I'm not hit with a definition or a, or a or a plan, I'm hit with a storyline, you know? And so that's my well, way. So, so it would out. it be, would it be too um, <clears throat> intrusive if I told you what I thought, what I saw is the the underlying thing? Oh, no, no. That's, yeah. I'm here for it. Let's do it. <laughs> Let's do it. Well, <clears throat> the one thing that really stood out to me was that in his moment of trauma and sadness, he was given a gift but rather than using the gift, um, passing it on, using it for the good of others, he used it solely for himself and became completely obsessed with um, what he wanted to get from that gift. Mm -hmm. And as a result, he had this completely reciprocally narrowed life that became destructive. Yeah. And I, I find that what you just described, I mean, never mind my movie, I find that what you just described a very relatable thing. You know, in, in the sense that there's like there's two like let me give you two exaggerations of a problem. Like one would be um, a problem we see in the movie with the with the city itself where they're kind of giving over to their appetites. Right. So they're not. Um, it's a modern problem is that people think their desires are their identity. And that's a um, that's a shifty thing. Um, that's a shifty thing to follow, because obviously, um, you know, our desires are not always they don't have our best interests in mind. I mean, if I just left myself up to my desires, I'd probably be on a couch eating, um, you know? And so, but because I want to have a meaningful life, I, I put off those desires until I absolutely don't, I can't anymore. You know, like the idea that I have to eat eventually and, and have to sit down and go to sleep. So um, because meaning matters. So, but the other side of that problem, so like that's something like addiction, right? So the idea with addiction mm -hmm. is that your, um, your appetites pester your mind until your mind says, okay, and so your mind comes up with a justification on how it can justify what your appetites want. And so that's a that's a bad pattern because now you're not in charge of your body. Your body's in charge of you. And that makes you closer to being an animal. Now, there's some there's another problem you have. So like there's a top down problem that can happen. So that would be a, a version of a bottom up problem. Like so my body and my appetites um, causing the problem upwards, like like a mob overthrowing the ruler. Well, you have the other problem is that is that the 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 tyrannical mind where the mind perceives the world incorrectly and then forces that perception on the body. And so I think a, a real solid example of this in real life is like anorexia, 
right? So anorexia is like the person has has formed the wrong perceptions of how they look and what healthy would be and what looks good on them. And they somehow tyrannize their body into submission. They starve it until uh, to try to head towards a, a, an unachievable result because there, you know, there's uh, a delusion happening, right? There's a, a dysmorphia. So um, when you see that with like, uh, but obsession can look like that. I mean, we, we run into this with our leaders all the time. It's, it, and I run into myself. I remember like when I got interested in a girl that was just way too far out of my league or was older than me. And, but you're ignoring your friends and you're, you're obsessing over something and you, everything reminds you of it. And you're kind of not attending to, the body and the things around you because you're you're obsessed with something that shouldn't be on your radar. And so I think what you just described is kind of like how I see a problem in my own life that I might be trying to work out in the film is this this like being a dreamer and have, being a visionary, but I still have to attend to my kids and my family and and these things. Mm-hmm. I can't I can't ignore them because I won't have uh, I won't have any I won't have anything of meaning. Um, and well, that so, certainly comes out with Oliver in the film. Yeah, that obsession. Um, even though he has he has good friends and he has a woman who cares about him and um, her identity, I found very interesting because it took Wait, me. Are we talking about Freya, the girl, like his assistant? Yeah. Okay. It took me two watches to realize that the 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 flapper with the dark hair was also Freya. <laughs> Wait, the flapper with oh the girl who comes on the elevator like when yeah. she comes the elevator oh yeah, yeah. okay that was yeah so Freya well that's it, it, it took me two watches to realize that so she's kind of she's willing to alter her identity in a sense to try to be more attractive to him because she's interested in him or at least that's the way it seemed to me yeah and, yeah, and right. he's so blind he can't see either version of her. And so he has all these things that could be good, meaningful things in his life, but he can't see any of them because of. His yeah. Experience. Yeah. Um, you know, so like uh, I worked on this, uh, I worked on the script, I, I wrote the story and then uh, I asked my friend, you know, Jonathan Peugeot to come in and help me uh, because I wanted to make the, I wanted to make the movie four dimensional and I wanted it to every prop, every element of the story to be, to be retelling the same story or, or uh, deepening an aspect of the story, including the character mm-hmm. names, like brooches they wore, their costume, um, you know, th- uh, things like this. So, um, oh, so I need to watch it again then because well, I'm so was 4D. <laughs> but that was his like I, cause I didn't I, I intentionally in my attempt to not make the story not let it be feral and wild in the world. I intentionally did not once I wrote it try to do a symbolic breakdown. Now I do symbolic breakdowns of other people's work and especially um, you know stories in the Bible and things like that. Um, but I wasn't interested in doing my own story because I think that this is a problem people have when they start to understand, like they, they start to try to recapture a symbolic worldview or a typological view, or even like more of this ancient cosmology we're talking about is that they'll impose it. Like they'll try to explain it to people. And it's like, that's not how it functions. It has to remain implicit or you kill it. Um, so, but Jonathan was saying about Freya, he's like, yeah, he's like, he, he said like, yeah, she's clearly what you presented here is the down to earth proper woman like if he if he wasn't looking so high he would realize he had the best scenario right in front of him she's already taking care of him in a way like a mother um you know because he's a little childish that's what happens in relationships if the guys doesn't grow up yet your your lover ends up being your mother um so uh there's a little bit of that going on but yeah that's how it was explained to me and i like that explanation so yeah i think you're onto something there but that's i was so worried about when i was making the film because there there's no audio and I just don't want to put people's names up on the screen every time they appear. And they're so I was trying to keep the dialogue on the screen limited, like so it was super tight. Mm -hmm. So it didn't slow the film down because I'm like, I'm spending all this time reading. Like, who wants to read when they go to a movie? So I tried to limit that as much as possible. But I knew that was the trade off I was going to get. I was like, some people might not understand right away that Oliver Graves is the young boy from scene one. Right. And some people well, might know that's pretty obvious. I mean, I, I don't think you'd be you surprised. That. Yeah, really? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I did some things. So we released this episodically at first because I didn't like want to make people wait for a year and a half for me to finish um, who follow us and wanted music and wanted content. So I, I released it in episodes. And after episode two was like people didn't some people didn't understand. So I went back when I made the final version and I overlaid 
like uh you know the boy on top of him when he's handing off the capricorn scale and stuff so, oh so, i see okay yeah yeah so also no as we as we talk first we can't give any spoilers like past like the rocket scene like so like all the stuff that happens after that i don't i won't discuss because yeah. i want to i want to save that sort of like twist for people that comes so well i don't want to give any spoilers i mean i no, you're doing great. I, I've, I said about as, great. I've said about as much as I want to say about the movie at this point, except that there was there's one song that really is so memorable. And I don't know if you want to talk about that or not, but I'd love to. One of the lines in the song is something to the effect that um, if you can't raise the dead, you'll raise hell instead. Yeah. yeah, <laughs> well, yeah but that's yeah. such a great concept. Was that original with you or? I it just hit me one day. Yeah, I hit me when I was writing the story. Um, and so I, I write very quickly, generally, but I will ruminate. So I'll write something. And so you might have noticed this as an artist. You might have done something like you, maybe you sketched an idea for a painting on a napkin and you're very excited about it. And then you get up the next day and you're like, that's not very good. So um, I've done this a lot. So I, I, I do things and then I put them aside and I sit on them. And that was... Um, I knew the song was going to be called Enchanté. I liked the play on words because in the song Enchanté, uh, I love French. Is, uh, I have French family members, and it's just it's so much more romantic than English. Like we'll say like greetings or hi or whatever. Like Enchanté is like I'm I'm in I'm enchanted by you. You're right. I oh you I I hear you. I I like your song, and so it's like it's like a presentation of music, like chanting and um enchanted. And our world is so disenchanted now. It's so dark, and people like don't see the spirit life anymore uh in a lot of ways or they do and it's totally detached from any kind of really usable narrative um and they're just kind of vaguely spiritual and um so i uh i would like that name for the song and so that was the second line that came to me was if you can't raise the dead you're going to raise hell instead because it's actually it's actually what happens to people if they can't find if they if they don't get in connection with um the idea that there is a creator if they bought into this idea that the right presupposition is that like matter produced everything we see somehow arbitrarily, you know, in a universe that exists for its own sake. If that's a, that's a disenchanted view. So the enchanted view is the idea that, Oh no, this was all made. You're supposed to be here. Uh, and it's telling a story and it's, and it's meant to it. The things you see are, are showing you the unseen world or the world you haven't seen yet in a way. So, um, well, when people lose that idea, it's like nihilism is going to abound. And how do you stave off this, how do you stave off this darkness and the fact that you're going to die one day? It's like, well, you have to indulge yourself in joys and little things in, that you enjoy. And um, and then we we get stuck in a world that thinks that uh, happiness is what it's all about. And that the pursuit of happiness is like a holy goal. And at no point does the pursuit of happiness produce anything but selfish people. Like, not that you should be miserable and that if you're miserable, that shouldn't be an indication that something should change. But the idea that you're just empty, like pursuing something like as simple or as vapid as just happiness is not going to make a wise and mature culture. So you end up raising hell. Like, that's where hell raising comes from. You don't you don't find a hell raiser that is a holy person. They just those two things are are the opposite. So um they're not someone who's overcoming uh, the, you know, they're they're overcoming their immediate desires uh, and putting them off for longer and longer uh, periods of time so they can have something better in the end. I mean, the same thing happens in marriage. It's like, it's like, okay, sure. You can go around and be promiscuous all you want. Uh, it's your body, you know, uh, but at the same time, it's like, well, there's certain things you're never going to get though. There's, there's some real treasures you'll never know unless you're faithful to one person and you set that thing aside for someone, it's, but it takes years to see it. And so that's why we have stories is so these these things that take years to see and these patterns that we're not going to know that it's going to destroy us right away. A good story can kind of what well, even if that's not the point of the story, a good story will start to expose that this will not lead to something beautiful or that like the the, the fact that you've lost sight of the angels and the heavens above um, might be the reason you can't get over your own appetites. Does that make sense? Well, yes, absolutely. But I mean, to me, there's another layer underneath that as well. The, mm -hmm. the idea of raising hell, of course, is a um, a cliche that we've used for a long time to, you know, to articulate exactly that. I mean, people who find all of their meaning in, in useless pleasures. But raising hell also has another meaning. It's like opening the gates and letting... Yeah letting the demons in, you know, letting the evil spirits take control. And um, 
So you talked earlier about addiction and I was contemplating that whole thing as I was watching the film and I've thought a lot about addiction anyway. And um, in our current psychopathological world where everything is um, psychological and I love Jordan Peterson, but I mean, he makes everything psychological and I, I know, I know you can, you can go way too far with that kind of thing. But yeah. um, it almost seems as though if, if I really look at addiction, I can take it all the way back to the garden. And in the sense that maybe everything evolves or devolves into addiction at the end of, of things. So is addiction an illness or is it sin or is it just, um, that this trick that our mind plays where we want to justify the things that we want, the heart wants what the heart mm -hmm. wants and, and our mind will justify that for us. The mind yeah, will yeah. fix it up so that, so that we're justified in, in accomplishing that. Right. So when you think about addiction, do you think about it as an illness or do you think about it as sin? Okay. Yeah. That's, that's a great fraud. I, I know I, that's fraud. Well, so the, the problem is when we, uh, I, I think they're the same word the way I think of it. Um, so I'm Eastern Orthodox. And so um, we think of sin as like a disease, not as if it's, if it's like God's a bean counter and he's sitting in heaven and he's keeping track of all these charges against you and just adding them up and adding them up. It's not like a legal ledger that, or like this kind of debt you're creating in that capacity. Um, is that the idea that, no, this is, this is something that's been imposed on you and it's plaguing you and you need to be healed of that thing. So as far as uh, the way I use those words, I understand that people use those words differently. They think about as like God kind of sitting up there and he's keeping a ledger and he's checking off. He's like, Oh, you did just enough things to be on the naughty list. Like, so um, but as far as sin being like ways we miss the mark to our, our detriment. So like Jordan Peterson uses that, uh, if you're going to bring him up, uh, where he talks about sin being an archery term, right? So uh, there are, there are people that won't define, they'll say, well, I did the wrong thing, but I had good intentions. Like that still fits the definition. It's still hurting you and hurting other people, whether you like, it's still a sickness, whether you meant to or not. So in archery, you're of course trying to hit the target and you miss that's sin. So, um, you know, so it's kind of one of those things you have to pay attention to because there's, uh, you know, addiction. Yeah, absolutely. It's a, it's a disease for sure, for sure. And I think that that's, um, you know, but the problem is this is a disease that we are, we're part of the pathology of, right? It's like, sure, there might be genetic proclivities towards it, but we contribute to that pathology. So um, I think that's an important thing uh, to understand because like you also made a really good point about how we want something and then we change the story so we think it's okay so we we lie to ourselves in a way and this is the problem this is the problem with experts and intelligent people and it's really sad when smart people don't get this is like you're always smart enough to come up with an excuse to do the dumb thing you want to do you're always smart enough to trick yourself so uh when it comes to things like when you want to talk about like a category like sin or um these kind of things it's there's intelligence is not the way out. Wisdom is the way out. Wisdom is the ability to play the real, the movie through to the end and know that this, this will, this will destroy me and the world around me. And I can't see that right away. Um, so yeah, that's a well, one. So one of the things that I learned maybe five or six years ago, it takes a long time to learn some of these things. <laughs> what, um, there's this woman who is, a. um, she's a neuroscientist who focuses on eating Mm -hmm. on uh, the effects of the the way that we lie to ourselves about food. <clears throat> mm -hmm. And she had put out some videos. And in one of them, she was explaining the, the uh, experiments that had been done in the 50s and 60s with these people whose brains had been um, divided because of, I believe it was epilepsy. It was, it was some illness that they were having a hard time helping people with, but they found that if they cut that corpus callosum that connects the two hemispheres, yeah. that they could stop the, um, um, I can't even think of the word now, seizures. They could stop the seizures. Right. Okay. And, and they also found that a person can function perfectly well with their corpus callosum divided, there, but there are a few little glitches that take place. And so they wouldn't do this nowadays, but in those days they thought, well, this has already been done to these people. So let's do some experiments on them. So mm -hmm. 
So one of the experiments that they did is they'd have this guy who has a separate left and right hemisphere. And of course the left hemisphere controls the right eye visually and the right hand and the right hemisphere controls the left hand and left eye visually. Mm -hmm. And so they would put up on the screen for him a, a image of something. Like a shoe, like, right? Hmm? Like, I, mean, I think I've seen this where they put a shoe up and one side saw it as the pattern of the shoe and one side saw it as leather. Did no, you, but oh, okay. it might, it might be a similar, it might be yeah. a similar test, but no, keep going. But Sorry. what they did is on the table, they put a bunch of like flashcards. Yeah. And, um, so there were a variety of flashcards and then they would ask him to, um, pick up something that reminded him of the image that he saw on the screen and then explain it. Why, mm -hmm. why it reminded him. Yeah. So maybe they put up a, a picture of a, a chicken on the screen. And then there's a picture of a drumstick on a flashcard. And so right. he'd, he'd hold up the flashcard and he'd explain this has to do with the chicken. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't remember the details of that one, but I do remember the details of one where they show a picture of a snowy day and a driveway. Mm. And um, there's, there's two. Yeah. I'm going to forget the details of this. <laughs> But, but you but sound the, like me right now. Keep going. Yeah. You're doing the great. Upshot, <laughs> the upshot of it was that in one hand, which I believe was the the left hand, so that would correspond to the right hemisphere. Yes, right. He picked up something that told a legitimate story about the snowy driveway, and mm -hmm. and in the right hand, he picked up um something that seemed completely. I've got this all screwed up. No, no, you're fine. I, well, I know the bottom line of yeah. the, here's the bottom line. The bottom yeah. line of it was that the left hemisphere um, is the only one that can speak. You know, the right hemisphere can't mm -hmm. articulate with words. The left hemisphere can speak. And so the left hemisphere made up a story about why he had picked this card up, even though the card was, completely unrelated but the left uh, hemisphere still made up a story that justified this card that he was holding up yeah so so what they learned from this and i got to go back and look at the details of this study but what they learned from this is that our brain lies to itself the left hemisphere will lie to the right hemisphere in order to justify something that it wants to believe yeah you just and, described and we politics have no control over that <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, there are parts of, I mean, I don't, I'm not a brain scientist. Uh, I've read a couple of books, uh, Ian McGill, Gilchrist, yes. um, yeah. you know, yeah. the master's emissary. I thought that was really insightful. I thought what was really insightful about that is if you've ever been inside of an Orthodox church and the way it's laid out, it's identical to what they're learning about the brain. It's like, it's shaped like consciousness. Um, that's something I can wow. get wow. after this. I've got, okay. I got to, I got to. Yeah. You got to know about this. So, okay. So um, that makes perfect sense to me when I think about it. Cause so, okay. So I am, I am right brained when I take a test that says like I'm right brain. That's most a lot of artists are right brain. Mm -hmm. um, and that is the side of your brain that's like trying to holistically understand how everything fits into this big picture. And then the other yeah. side of your brain has like a program. So it's like one side of the program or one side of the program. And the program doesn't want to change. The program doesn't like to it, it sees things outside of it, it, outside of what the program can account for as bad. So if you're introduced <laughs> with something new um, that doesn't fit that program. You know, it, this happens in, in hyper conservative people. They'll have a disgust reflex very easily. They'll have this burn it with fire reflex. I don't really have that enough. I probably should have it more. Uh, I'm too curious. You know, I'm like, uh, you know, I may be too curious sometimes. So uh, when you think about those, the 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 fact that your the two hemispheres are inhibited is absolutely necessary because, well, think about it this way. You might think about, oh, gee, shouldn't that side that's like upholding your tradition listen more? To the side that's trying to renew and update that tradition, it's like, well, just think about anything you did. Like you're trying to run a company and you're trying to change your strategies and your approach every day or every time you have a new idea, you're trying to implement it. Like it will fall apart so fast. Um, so, uh, you know, and then there's a bad version of that same pattern, which is like something that's happened politically right now where some viewpoints are just anti-traditional in general. Like they're unwilling to see the value in anything that would have been in the past considered traditional. They just want to write over that tradition, right? Rewrite the tradition. So I have to be careful with myself because like, I mean, as not politically liberal, um, but temperamentally liberal in the sense that I um, have an imagination. I'm a dreamer. 
I'm always looking for new ways to do things and, and, and things to update. But at the same time, I have to understand that like, no, you can't like you have to, sometimes what's tried and true is going to be right a lot more and what your, your program's already running. So like that whole perspective is even McGilchrist talks about this when you uh, like, if, if someone's blinded in the dark, that they'll use their right hand to protect that themselves, their tradition. And the left hand is reaching out, trying to find a way out, right. Trying to discover and learn the room. Uh, and that happened. That makes sense too, because like one hand is more, um, you know, my I could if I was going to lose a hand as a right-handed person, I'm I'm totally okay with losing my left hand compared to my right hand. Like not not that I want to lose either hand as a musician, but um, you know, understand like that. Like if I was going to lose one, you know, I'll sacrifice the left hand, the one that's reaching out there, being daring. And so that this is also has to do with another function of stories. Is that for stories are an exploration of. Um, you know, so like my story, I don't want to give too much away, but uh, I don't hide the fact that it's a little bit tragic and a tragedy, uh, a tragedy kind of tells us it let, helps us play through an idea. Right. And if we like like we use our imaginations to try out an idea so that we don't die in real life, that our idea will die in our imagination, you know, when we test it out. And so that's the other problem with if we were totally right brain brain, we would die way more often, like <laughs> way earlier, because we'd be trying things and we'd be experimenting and. We'd want to see if gravity was really real and things like that. So that in, that uh, divider is really important in the mind. So it's so interesting too. Like I think it was uh, you know, Jonathan Peugeot's brother, uh, Matthew Peugeot. Uh, he came up with probably the two best words I've heard um, to describe the 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 two different viewpoints we all have in our own mind. And one has to do like the left side of our brain, like which would be right hand symbolism. So this is the problem with talking about these things. You got to constantly flip it in your mind. When I say left brain, you got to think right hand. So the right hand of God, the right hand is, this is the tradition. This is the thing that's been established as true. And then the left hand is that which brings in renewal. Okay. So he uh, talks about renewal. And so this is um, renewal is a very, very important part of the world, but things can't be washed out all the time. You can't build on water. So if you think about renewal as like the waters of baptism, this washing away and establishing something new, it's positive. If you think about renewal as like a flood of chaos, it's a problem. So um, I think those two words he's landed on, I think, are really important for people understanding those two things. Because if you walked into an Orthodox church, um, the whole building shaped like a cross, right? And the four poles of the cross have a very specific symbolism. Now, if I talk about this too long, I'll I'll say something heretical. So I have to be careful um, because it's you don't want to like this. You need it to remain a little wild, too. You can't totally nail it down. But um, so there's uh, there's the narthex where you enter. It's kind of like the feet. It's like the, your feet. It's the point where you meet the world. It's the point where the church meets the world. Um, your brain has this the same point. So if you like as, as I'm talking about this building in the cross, think about putting a cross right over the top of your head and your brain's divided exactly like a cross already. You can just map it out and, and you have this frontal lobe, which is like the heavens. And you have this back part of your brain um, like you know, that deals more with the embodied experience and controlling your body. And then you have the two hemispheres that have these two different perspectives. It's like the horizontal plane we live in. Uh, and we see this come out in politics a lot, the two different perspectives, it's like the one that's trying to renew tradition and, and erase tradition and the side that's trying to defend tradition. Um, so, if you look at the church and the way they've laid out uh, what's on the right and the left, the the the, the saints and the biblical figures and uh, the things that appear on the left side of the church all have to do with renewal, like John the Baptist, like he's out in the wilderness. He's like a marginal character in a way, or the apostle Paul who went out into the Gentiles. And on the other side, you have the, you know, you have the mother of God, you have uh, Mary and you have uh, Peter and you have uh, people like that. And, and that has to do more with like, what protects and keeps tradition, what, what nurtures the tradition. And so, and then the, uh, the very top part of the cross, like where they have the sanctuary is where the secrets are, where, where, you know, where the hidden thing is, where it's the highest point, where the most important things come down to us in, in the body. So you have this, this narthex nave, um, structure and then the, the sanctuary, which is like the heavens. And so it's just so fascinating to me. I'm, I'm just sitting there reading, uh, in McGilchrist book. And I was like, you guys are just figuring this out now. Like the church has known this for thousands of years and it's literally in our architecture. Cause we don't think about mm -hmm. architecture that way anymore. Karen, we just, uh, 
We think about the architecture is more about the architect and their yoke they're putting on things, their viewpoint, their perspective. And it turns sometimes it can be very anti-human and 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 have nothing to do with nature in any capacity. And or we think about that with the artist, it's like their take on their things. And meanwhile, like in the ancient world, architecture was trying to reflect a greater reality. It wasn't the art, the architect would disappear into the structure. The artists uh, who were doing the iconography weren't signing their names and things like that. They were trying to disappear and and realize that their craft was to expose a greater reality. And so this is what reenchantment is. This is this is when an artist is talking about reenchantment's a tough word to use. There's other words. Uh, my friend Richard Rowland uh, uses the word sacramental imagination, which is pretty cool, but I can't explain it as well as he can. Um, because uh, the idea that the world has become so horizontal and flat through this materialistic viewpoint where we've lost that top part of the cross. And we've even lost the ability to um, discern what's happening in that capacity. And we don't think we don't think think things are teleological that they exist for a purpose that we just apply and make up purposes as people that they didn't have some transcendent purpose um it, so reenchantment is fighting that reenchant reenchanted stories and artists are fighting this idea that um you know that like oh that uh love is a trick that evolution played on us like that's a terrible story i hate that uh where people kind of describe like oh all of our positive social patterns um, yeah, they're, they were like evolution was just trying to get us to get along and procreate and love was just one of those things, uh, except you can't live in that story. Like good luck proposing to someone well, or asking them on a date. Not, not to mention how much agency they're giving evolution in that story. Oh yeah. It's like a weird mythical. It's a weird crooked God. Yeah, it's yeah. exactly right. They can't help it. It has to become teleological when they start to describe the story, um, so I just think, man, I just like, no wonder I was just watching this video on depression in it's in cities and some of the cities in america 30 percent of the population is de diagnosed as depressed it's like oh my gosh like no wonder like we we've stripped out all the things that sure we need food for our bodies but we need food for our spirit and our soul too like soul like we need something that speaks to our soul and the idea that like you're here and like it doesn't matter that you're here and you're arbitrary it's just it's not in any of us like we do we know there's something transcendent out there we know it when we see something beautiful in nature we know it when we when you go tour a cathedral when you hear an incredible piece of music it's so hard to deny in that moment that there's something more happening than just a bunch of atoms smashed together until you're here and and i'm here and so it's uh that's that's what reenchantment's about. So like these things, when I'm talking about these perspectives, I'm actually just trying to bring back out into the world the thing I experienced at church. Uh, I mean, I hate to say it that way because people think proselytizing, and I'm not. A, I'm, that's not what I'm doing at all. I'm like, no, you're you're dying out here. Like I, I meet people, no one likes them. Like no one loves them in their life. They have friends. No one like no one's taking care of them. No one's saying anything kind. No one knows how to be kind enough. No one knows. No one has enough people that love them in their life. So when I'm making art, I'm trying to love an audience. When I'm when I'm making uh when I go and order a coffee, I'm trying to like love the barista. You know, so I'm trying to take back that pattern that's enchanted my life into the world. And if that's proselytizing, like all right, fine. Like, but am I bad for that? <laughs> Is that a bad pattern? You know what I mean, Karen? You know, you you feel like this ever? <laughs> I gave you a lot. Well, to think about I, I just, I just keep letting you talk because everything you're saying is, um, is true. You, you said early on, you said um, <clears throat> what you wanted to do is expose how reality actually works. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of been the purpose behind my channel from the beginning. Yeah, I love is that. To say um, there is such a thing as reality. And they're mm -hmm. actually and and reality um, has a purpose, and reality has a name, and his name is Jesus. Um, Jesus says, "I am the way, the truth, and the life." And the word for truth in the Greek is the same as the word for reality. Mm. So he's telling us right there: if you want to know how the universe works, just look at me. And, and we see that in the first chapter of Colossians, right? Um, so. Oh, that's a great point. Yeah. So, so anyway, w one of the reasons I got started on my channel was that I had this idea that, um, and it's something I've been mulling around for like 20 some years, ever since I started working on this aspect of creativity. Mm -hmm. I I've told the story before a little bit that I, 
I ended up taking the class eight times, but I took a class from a guy who taught art through the lens of creativity, the elements and principles of art. And, um, and he laid down some ground rules for us. We didn't actually paint in the class. I loved it because I didn't have to take all my gear with me. Yeah. We'd just go and we'd talk and we would, uh, we would bring our paintings as, as we get them done. We would critique each other. There were ground rules for how we did the critiquing, and it was always a very positive experience. But one of the key things that I learned from him is that you have to set very strong constraints or limitations for yourself in order to generate creativity. Yeah, now you're talking. Keep going. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so the the um, the first rule he gave us was that you're going to do 20 large paintings over the course of this. Mm -hmm. They have to be large because an idea that can look good in a postage stamp, when you paint it large, there has to be something more. Mm -hmm. You can't just rely on this little concept. You have to give it more. There has to be yeah. meaning and purpose and beauty in every inch. And how do you do that when you've expanded up to this large thing? At the same time, when it's large, it has to read. You have to be able to see from a distance. Oh, yes, there is something there, something that would draw you from across yeah. the room yeah. on that it's large a good canvas. Teacher. Yeah, keep going. I like this. Yeah. So um, you're going to do 20 paintings. You're going to do two a week, so it's going to push you. You're going to have to work really hard and really fast. Um, every painting has to be of the same subject. Mm. And the subject has to be in the same place on the, can on the rectangle or on the square every week. So you're doing basically, so my cellist series, it's this cellist. She's sitting mm -hmm. in a certain position. Yes. That's the requirement. You have to, all the cellists have to be sitting the same way. You, you can't modify that at all. Um, now what's going to happen after you paint that cellist two or three or four times the same way, maybe you change the colors, maybe you change where the light's coming from pretty soon. You're like, what am I going to do now? This is getting so boring. <laughs> what am I going to do now? And it's that constriction that's placed on you that forces you to think, well, what if, what if I did this? What if I did that? And then the fact that you have to come in with two paintings every week because you're accountable because everybody's waiting on you. <clears throat> everybody's depending on their own learning from what they're going to learn from you. So you're pushed to try things. And, um, and, and it's a very, this constraint limitation thing generates creativity. And so it occurred to me there's something meaningful there about the universe. Bingo. <laughs> that right. And so, yeah. and, and if, if it's that way at scale at our scale, maybe it's also that way at the cosmic scale and maybe it's also that way at the atomic scale. And so I started looking into science and <clears throat> literature and history and psychology and all of these things, trying to see, does this same pattern play out everywhere? And indeed it does. Yes. And so then I thought, well, okay, one of the other, one of the other um, patterns is context, how important context is. And uh, for a while, I thought context is everything. I had really gotten to the place of considering context to the place where I thought context is everything. But one of the things that Jordan Peterson did was kind of wake me up from that to say, no, context isn't everything. Mm -hmm, because mm -hmm. if context were everything, then even some of the postmodernists would be correct. And, and I know there's a flaw in postmodernism. So context is not everything, but it's super important. Yeah, yeah. It's, so, a, it's on the table with everything else. It's part of the atmosphere. Yeah. Right. Well, so so yeah. I mean, just give you one example of how context works with the elements and principles, because the elements are <clears throat> the, the, the seven elements that I work from. I mean, every, every art textbook probably list these out a little bit differently, but we can just work with these. Mm -hmm. The elements are what show up in every painting. They probably show up in every piece of music as well. Yeah. Uh, line, size, shape, direction, color, value, and texture. So value is light and dark, mm -hmm. white and black. Um, <clears throat> but the interesting thing about value is that it's contextual because something that is light in one context can actually be dark in another. 
if your entire painting is high key, so everything is different shades of light values, then the darkest of those light values will appear to be dark compared to the lightest of those light values. Right. If you have a painting that's all dark values, kind of like Queen of the Night, then, then the things that are sort of mid-tone dark are going to show up as light in that context. Yeah, because, yeah, yeah, exactly. Right? Yeah. Okay, so, so that's the way it works. So you can always get a darker dark or a lighter light, but then you can think of that thing all the way through spiritual truths. You can think of that thing all the way through um, cosmic reality. I mean, these things that are patterns that, that show up in the making of art show up in every single category of knowledge that we have stumbled onto in our thousands of years on this planet. Yeah. So, um, so it seems to me that art is some kind of a compression algorithm for narrative. Compression and decompression. Yes, you're right. No, I, I agree with everything you're saying. Like, so one of the things I'll say, like, so let's just take, okay, so let's talk about, uh, you, you gave me a couple of great things there. Like you talked about that, that, you know, art, art and artists flourish when there's a constraint. Of course, that's how everything works for like to have, just think about a plain object. That's, uh, you know, a silhouette, you have to have negative space and positive mm -hmm. space to identify the object. If it was yeah. all positive space, you have a square on a canvas, right? So Mm -hmm. um that or you, then it, then it actually becomes all negative space um so the uh the thing is like so when i sit down to make something it's like i have to come up with boundaries that i'm going to play with and that's fun that's my sandbox i call it like i throw a bunch of toys in that sandbox and this is these are the boundaries i'm going to go in i'm going to in and when i when i'm when we're using like let's say a form of music like popular music like okay we're writing a pop song it's like okay the world knows the rules of that game so now i have a chance to play with the audience and their expectations within those rules. And so now I, we, you know, I can surprise them. I can subvert them. I can satisfy them. This is, you know, I can create conflict. I can create resolution within that space, but without space, you're just like drifting around in the middle of, of the sea, like a buoy. Like that's not, that's not anything that people, you can't build on that. You can't, you can't last in that space long. And so the idea that like a lot of these contexts, a lot of these confines are just constructs is part of the, the decomposition of our society because if well these things that we actually experience and we can use like tools we can use words we can use ideas we can we can talk about beauty we can functionally talk about these things the idea that these are just constructs is like oh it's like well we're just drifting in the middle of the ocean and we don't have any bounds to play with it's like your your beauty is not my beauty and so on and so forth but i'm actually in the in the court where i believe that there's a transcendent beauty and that by creating these little microcosms like this confined project we can expose in this small setting compressed mm -hmm. a pattern of the beauty in the world so the 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 uh decompression happens in what you're talking about there in the sense that like we have these moments of consciousness where we um we see something we want or we I, we go into a room let's say you're hungry and you go into a room and you identify good food like there's actually a story that happened in your head very quickly, faster than you even realized it was happening. So fast that you might not even realize it was a process. It just feels immediate, right? So when you tell a story, so like, let's take a story. Um, you know, the one I used to uh, illustrate this is pretty universal. I could use the, I could use something like uh, Lord of the Rings, but I'll use the Wizard of Oz, even though it's not as good of a story, is that Dorothy has a frame. She begins the story with a frame of home. She's like, home, I don't like home. I want to go out into the world. She goes out in the world and realizes the value of home. So it's a there and back again journey. So this is what every time we're looking around in the world, we're having there and back again journeys very quickly as we're looking for things like I'm in a space or let's just say you go to a new space, like someone uh, someone serves you a dish at a restaurant and you don't know what it is, right? And you have this moment of exploration where you're discovering, oh, what this is. Like it might be confusing at first, but then you have you have the ability to identify it. So uh, when it comes to context, like too, food's a great example of that in the sense that you have like your, you know, like your, like a meat, like a steak, and then you have um, things you add to it to add savor, like salt, like you have uh, seasonings, and then you have spices and spices like can kind of take that food into a different part of the world. And then what you garnish it with and like, you know, suddenly you can see like what an artist is doing in a painting. Sometimes you can look at something that we all experience and we realize that we've experienced that same thing. In the same way that you can recognize that something's too far out of context, where if you're at a Chinese restaurant and you're having, uh, you know, General uh, Chow's chicken, 
and suddenly there's spaghetti marinara on the plate, you've got a problem, <laughs> right? It's out of context. It's not, it, it, it broke the, it broke the confines of what was taking us, what was transporting us somewhere else. Now it's like, it's too much mixture. It's not a good synthesis. So I think those things you're talking about, like this so important, like for artists to understand that, like they just, they don't, they think they don't want rules. And it's like, no, you can't have a game without rules. You can't have a story without boundaries to that story. You can't have, you can't have anything without um, these sort of structures. So I think those are those are super important. But even beyond that, I think something that people need to wrestle with, and it's something very hard to put into words, is that is that like real beauty is real, and it's and it transcends your opinion, right? And so this is, I, I think our culture is too much stuck in the idea, like I have my way, you have your way, but there is definitely a universal sense of beauty. There are transcendence. And uh, if if people can understand that, though, we can get back to something more of like a unified art, because uh, the problem is with we're talking about these things like the the boundaries and the rules and the context, those can also be used against an audience, an artist. Um, the same thing that makes art good can also make art very bad in the sense that uh, there's this exchange that can happen in a world that has commoditized uh, commoditized uh, entertainment and uh, made it a commodity is that, oh, I'm in the mood to be scared tonight. So is there a good horror movie? Right. So it's like you there's this kind of like drug dealer relationship that's happened with the entertainment industry and people where we forgot that stories aren't escapism, that they're actually opening up a greater reality to us. Like you said, they're presenting us. They're presenting us with things that happen too fast for us to see or over too long of a time for us to really know, you know, this is what you're doing when you're a parent, like you're, you've got kids and you're like, listen, you can't, if you do this, if you go to bed without brushing your teeth, your teeth will go to hell eventually. Like literally they will like, they will fall apart and fall out of your mouth and you'll be miserable. Um, so you're going to take this little bit of suffering and go brush your teeth right now. And I'm going to make you do it because you can't see what will happen yet that I know that your teeth will fall apart. And so, like, we don't think of that as artistry, but that's kind of like what a good story does or a good art does. It presents us with something that that's at too great of a distance and it brings it close to us. Does that make sense? Yeah. And you 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 opened up a box there for me that um, I've been trying to figure out for a long time. And I think you gave me a handle on it. And that is <clears throat> when talking about these rule sets that we work within mm -hmm. that that allow us to bring down this little bit of beauty. Um, the way that design and creativity in art has set, has discovered these elements and principles over the centuries of what makes people want to look at art, what draws people in. Yeah. So the, the principles are um, concepts that can be applied to the elements. Mm -hmm. So the principles are unity, um unity variation unity harmony contrast dominance repetition variation gradation and balance yeah and each of those principles can be applied to the elements to an element or to you know all the elements can apply to each other the principles can in some respect apply to each other so if you put them all together into a matrix, you have this multiplication that gets astronomical, especially when you add in color and value and, and all the potential there. Mm -hmm. So one of the reasons you need constraint is you have so many choices to make that if you didn't have some constraint, you would be completely immobilized. You'd have no way to get, get through that field of infinity. Right. But one thing that has always puzzled me is that, well, you can take those elements and principles and you can, if you apply them rigidly, you can create all sorts of design things that we see graphic design that's used for um, advertising. You know, you open up any magazine and they have all this um, original <laughs> graphic design that is supposed to be enticing to the eye that gets you to keep looking at the magazine, but it's not what you would call art. Right, so right. these elements and principles can be instrumentalized and just produce something that is, you know, it's like almost like these Christmas movies that Netflix is pumping out. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah, you, that's the prime example right there. My gosh. Keep going. Oh, yeah. That's so formulaic, right? Right. But so what distinguishes 
if, if art is also based on these elements and principles, what distinguishes art or, or the beauty that's inherent in art from these, these graphic design principles that just anybody can put together? And so one of the things that I always noticed is that I can't paint with the elements and principles in mind. Mm hmm. I just, I can't, I can't. No, I yeah, can't me either. That. I know exactly right? what you're talking about. Right. But, but having internalized the elements and principles, yeah. I can let go and then I can paint and maybe stop once in a while and say, okay, something's not quite right here. The balance is off. There's not, I don't have harmony over here. Um, mm -hmm. <clears throat> I need some non-identical repetition here to make this area more interesting. I can stop once in a while and, and think about it. But then when I go back to painting, I have to let go of all that and just paint. Yeah. And, and I think maybe what happens when you instrumentalize something is that if you're concentrating on the instrumental aspect of it, you lose all the creativity and you just, well, not necessarily the creativity, but you just get these like graphic design things that show up in magazines that are not art. It's, it's clearly not art. Yeah. Somehow we can tell when we look at it. Right. Yeah. We have, to, we have to use, of course, uh, you know, what you're saying is very smart. I, I totally agree with it. And uh, like what you're talking about when you're actually working on the thing itself um, or you're ideating, it's like, I'm not thinking, I'm not thinking like through the, the, those principles. Like if you want to put it that way, that's a great way to put it, but I've internalized those. And, um, and that at the other hand, I do have a moment when I'm done or, or normally when I hit a problem, then I stop. And I look back and I get principled and I start to have a checklist of questions I ask myself. Mm -hmm. So, but I mean, I separate the critic from the artist. Um, I think it's important too, that we separate two, like, because the word, when we say art, we're sometimes we mean two things. Cause there's, there's an art of just getting anything to fit well together. Like, you know, there's an art, like things we wouldn't consider art when we're assembling a piece of uh, Ikea furniture we brought home. Not, not, I'm not saying that Ikea furniture is, is, great and superior furniture but i'm just saying like people might have that common experience of assembling thing and trying to get it to fit well together that's uh art there's an art to that but then there's this other art and this is gonna be a weird definition but i think it's closer to faith okay so when we're what you're talking about art we're in the sense where it's like it lifts you somewhere else it surprises you it shows you something that was just flat and it makes it three-dimensional again to you. It takes a concept you had kind of thrown off into the background and it makes you re-engage it, right? Um, that's something closer to faith. And so the problem is when you say the word faith is that people conflate that with the word belief. And there's an aspect of faith that has to do with belief. Um, but I think faith is a much more reasonable thing as much as, as you don't want to demystify it. It's a much more reasonable thing than let's say just your uh, you know, average everyday atheist might think it is. They might see it as some kind of weird leaps. And I don't think of faith as a leap at all. I think everything begins with a presupposition, which is something that we have to suppose to be true without evidence yet, or you can't start to think. So you have to have these axiomatic ideas. And so an axiomatic idea I don't like is the one that uh, that the universe is not created. Because the problem with that idea is if you don't accept that axiom, you cannot collect evidence that it was created. Like you don't have a container for it. So you can only look at half of the universe. You can only look at matter and the cause and effect of matter. So as far as I'm concerned, that's a very uh, that's a very narrow way of looking at the universe. Like so the scientific materialistic view, I think, is is too narrow to possibly understand and collect and categorize the universe properly. OK, so for me, a presupposition of faith might be something like this. We're going to go general. We're not going to make it overly Christian. Uh, it would be the idea that like you look at the world around you and you realize it's intelligible. So you have the presupposition that, OK, maybe. Uh, or just like you start to collect the idea that, okay, this, this could all be intentional. This could all be a work of art in itself. This could all be a symphony and it's pointing at something and it's showing us something. It's like, okay, so I, that's my presupposition. And now I have this container. I can go and collect these things. Right. And as you start to collect these things, you realize you might realize something like this. So you talked about Christ and like the incarnation is a really important thing because it exposes the fact, like, cause if you're a Christian, uh, Christ doesn't write any book of the Bible like with his own hand, right? He always mediates that through someone else. Someone else writes it down, even when he's speaking. Someone He didn't write it down and hand it out to people. They had to listen and write it down. And so uh, we start to learn that everything about the unseen, right, the things that are too high for us to see are mediated on a level we can see. So that creation itself, the pattern of things, um, the uh, 
you know, so there's there's a pattern to life and that pattern becomes surprisingly coherent when you start to look at it. It's not arbitrary at all, like you were pointing out with some of these fractal levels you were talking about in the cosmos. And uh, so there you start to notice that like, oh, my gosh, wait, I have a day and my day is just like a life, like in the sense that I'm a I start as a baby. Right. And I grow up and, uh, you know, I start to go to school. Uh, I, there was a point where I was naked and unashamed about it, but then I grow up and I, I eat solid food and I go to school and I and I get out of school and hopefully those principles are in my heart and I go out and live them out. But then eventually I'm going to return to the earth the same way I got here. We're going to revert to the point where I'm like, I, I start to lose my energy. I start to lose my consciousness, my ability to remember. I mean, you might, you might leave the world in diapers, just like you entered the world, like, you know, in your early stage, it, you're going to repeat the cycle, but then you start to realize like, that's what a day is like. A day is the same thing. I get up, I get dressed, I prepare for work. I go and actually work. I come home, I do recreational things. I eventually lose my energy. I lay down, I lay down flat and I have a dream. It's like, oh, that sounds a lot like a, like the Christian idea of a life. It's like, oh, that's actually a reasonable idea, like uh, a Christian idea of what's actually going on. I'm actually experiencing every day. So the story is so catchy because it's it's identical to reality if you actually understand how to interpret it. So now you can look at that pattern and you look at the Bible and you realize the same patterns at work. It's like, oh, people came into the world naked. They were unashamed by it. There is a point where they became conscious of it. They started to eat solid food. Eventually they ate meat. They were surrounded by giants like we are when we're kids. Uh, they, they're schooled under the law and they and they graduate um, with the law in their hearts under Christ. And that eventually the earth come, the world comes right back around to where it started, where all of these errors we've made add up over time. And there's this like apocalypse, like a death. And so that we see that like, oh, that's what time is. Time isn't necessarily this chronological, like chronic set of numbers. It's this warm, personal human category. Like we can look at time through our own life and our own day and our own instances. So, um, but even like a moment where you recognize something for the first time, you go through that same journey I just described. Like you have an infancy, you don't know what it is. You're unaware, you're naive. And then you become self-conscious or you become aware of what it is. And then you you have a journey with that thing. So, um, okay. So why would I, uh, I picked that pattern because th this is one pattern. Uh, I can probably talk about this for like 40 hours without notes about all these patterns that start to stack up. So what, what we're left with at the end of the day, when Christ comes as a man, and he's exposing that everything of all the secrets of God are being mediated through mankind and through creation. So when I go and take an SAT test and I'm getting out of high school and they there's a mathematical section, and they're like, OK, here's a number set. And they give me a one, a four, a seven and a ten and then an equal and a question mark. It's like, well, what's the invisible number? Well, the invisible number is 13 because we're going up by threes, right, for example. Right. And. Faith is that. Faith is the, you. it begins with the right presupposition. It begins with observation. And then you extend those patterns into the unseen. And that is what you're, what you're describing. The other type of art is best when it does that, right? It's not pointing to something smaller. It's not like flipping a telescope around and looking at a very tiny, crisp image of something. It, it takes the world around and gathers it. And it says, hey, where's this pointing? Where is this pointing? There's something more to this world than you know. You were born into it. You were confused and you're distracted. But the artist is for that moment, like when we're experiencing good art, those distractions kind of melt away and we can see this bigger thing. And so I love that version of the word art. Like there's those two versions. And I do both things where I just try to get everything to fit together. And then there's this other part where it's something closer to faith where it's like, ah, like you're you're missing the riddle maybe and maybe as an artist i can see the riddle a little better maybe that's one of the things i was giving i was given that burden maybe maybe you're given that burden um but we try to help people answer the invisible number set that's ahead uh which is a that's a boring way to say it compared to what art really is but um but that's that's i think the kind of art you're referring to um when you're talking about it's not art or it is art, meaning that it's not it's not art when it points at something too small and it reduces the world into something where um, it doesn't elevate what it means to be human. It doesn't elevate it doesn't elevate what it what it means for me to look at someone else. Like I need to see that person is made in the image of God. Well, well, so let me let me add one other thing in here. One of the one of the principles. Well, it's not a principle, but one of the guidelines for me has always been edges. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so when you're painting. You, your edges have a purpose. 
So very sharp edges are typically used in the area that you want people to focus the most or to lead your eye to the place where you want people to focus the most. But in the areas where you want more um, mystery, mm -hmm. you leave the edges sort of diaphanous or um, kind of like your movie where there's there's a lot of room for the viewer to think, to add their own their own yeah. characteristics to it, right? Mm -hmm. And um, And so... I think somehow edges tie into this whole thing. When you were talking about the the invisible number set, I just love that image because a lot of times the way you describe when you made the movie and the way I feel when I paint is oftentimes I don't know what the whole I don't know what the invisible number set is, but yeah. I'm just I'm just painting from from the um, I've always liked to use this term. It's my experiential DNA. <clears throat> The thing yeah, that yeah, makes me right. unique as an individual is yeah. all the experiences that I've ever had and the books I've read and the songs I've listened to and the conversations I've had with people. And every single one of those things has modified who I am to where I'm a completely unique vessel, completely unique individual. And so is everybody else, which is one reason I always thought everybody needs to find some way to creatively add to the universe because it's kind of like when you're in a really good Bible study and everybody has their opportunity to talk about what the meaning is for them. You get this complete picture that's so much more rich and beautiful than if just one person is telling you from the top down, this is what this means. You're right. And um, so if every person, a lot of times we can't articulate what's inside of us, but when we entertain something creatively, whether it's cooking that perfect steak with all the nice garnishes mm -hmm. or whether it's making a piece of music or a movie or a piece of art or writing a book or telling a story or raising children in an artistic way or creatively designing your house, whatever it is, when we bring that creative aspect into life, it allows us to articulate those things that are beyond our left brain capacity to articulate. Yeah. And that adds to the to the general beauty of the world and to our general ability to communicate meaning. Yeah, right. As long as well, as long as there's something to unify it. Like so the idea, like for example, you give a Bible study idea and you could sit in a room of people and and someone says, I think this means this, and I think this means this. That's fine. Like there's there's like any aspect of thing you could talk about, there's an almost an infinite number of ways to see it that are true. But there's also an infinite number of ways to see it that are false, maybe even more ways to see it that are false. So you have yeah. to remember that, too, like the idea that I said, we're at a Chinese restaurant and they served you spaghetti marinara and you're like, this doesn't fit. And so there also it has to be that's that's a fine way to look at the world. As long as you understand, there has to be uh, something unify us all back together. So when we're we're all unique, but we all have something incredible, we all have a ton of things in common, like way more in common that it makes us unique. I mean, that's the same with like my, my music, like if in the sense that like, okay, um, oh, your music's very original. It's like, it's like 2% original or you wouldn't understand it at all because mm -hmm. it's like a one, I didn't invent any of the things I'm using almost any, I mean, there's a couple, but it's like, you know, someone handed me a guitar and I learned to play it. And someone, you know, I had a cello behind me and a piano and, and I learned these things. I didn't, those things were given to me. Like I have those in common with other musicians. Right. And so it starts to, you, when you start to look at it at the end of the day, like what you're contributing this new is actually, is actually very small, like too. So we don't want to see the differences. The differences are essential, but we also have to see that there is, like you say, like a through line to those things. Yeah. So if someone says my, okay. So when someone tells me like, we can all have opinions and the opinions make the world interesting. And I don't want to restrict other people's opinions, but also I want to say that that's a, I can I can know the difference between an opinion that's beautiful and a, an opinion that's evil like when someone's telling me the world's overpopulated I'm like okay well, which people are you going to get rid of like this is a terrible idea like that's a that's not the way to think of it because um you know so part of the through line is like life is it doesn't bring life and doesn't bring love doesn't bring beauty um because beauty will it pulls the world together right so um one of the things I like I have kids and so I tell them it's like listen you can't talk bad about other kids you can't judge them like you can't be judgmental it's like why it's like well, if you pay attention long enough, you're going to get insecure when you do that because you believe in Imago Dei that they're made in the image of God. And so if someone made in the image of God can be treated the way you're treating that person or thought of the way you're thinking of that person, that means that gets to come right back to you. 
and you're going to be insecure because you're going to leave a room and you know that people are going to be saying things like you would say about them or the idea that if if it's okay for you to treat someone that way that means like how much more right does god have to judge you right so this um these these things have to be nested in in a larger storyline and this is part of the problem that uh, you know we have in a world, and it's why we need things like like democracy is like a fine mediating structure for the world we live in, in the sense that nobody agrees on the ma- the big story that's happening. So, like, how do you deal with that problem? It's like, well, you give everybody a vote, right? Okay, so democracy might taint our view because that's really not the ideal scenario. The ideal scenario is that um, everyone has the best story in mind, the highest story, the the story that that accounts for everything that could be accounted for. And that now we show our differences within that story, and then we can see our real roles as part of one body that's unified. So, um, you know, so I'm like, I'm like very not postmodern, as you can tell, like in the sense, <laughs> like, I just, I think there are transcendence and I think that you can define them. I think you can point to them. I think they're more than your definition, but we can all look at the same things. And, and I, so I live near the beach and like, there's some beautiful sunsets here in, in sunrises in Florida. And when I'm driving along at the sunrise in the morning, I don't know what any of these people believe. Like we're not unified, maybe politically, we're not unified spiritually, but everybody's stopping and all is stopped in awe. And everybody's like hanging out the windows of their car, taking pictures because there's something going on. Like there's a, the, the, the earth is lifting to meet the heavens at these points. And there's the same reason why every scientist and atheist isn't going to skip the cathedrals they go to in Europe and overseas. They're not going to skip them because there's something more. There's something that's the kind of art I want to make. I don't want to make the art that's just can be dismissed as like, eh, it's just another guy giving us this thing, trying to make a buck. It's like, no, I want to raise the earth up and where the heavens meet. This happens. This happens in nature. Sometimes this happens in an incredible architecture. This happens in incredible art. So yeah, I totally understand what you're saying. And I love this idea that, that everyone exists to tell a different part of the same story in the end, uh, the, in the same story. But if it's not I mean, but if they've been distracted and they've been deceived, that 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 opinion, it doesn't it's not in context anymore. It's it's a it's a opinion of death. Right. And so I'm all about life and beauty. So that's where I'm that's where I'm hopefully doing with my art. I hope so. The audience gets to be the judge in the end. I don't get to decide what it is they do. So. Well, so where can people see your art? Yeah. Okay. So um, Queen of the Night is on our YouTube channel. But if you go, I think the one place you can get to everything is through dirtpoorrobins.com. I mean, hopefully we can leave a little uh, link in the description of the video. Um, Robins like the bird with one B. Um, And so I've got my music there and I've got, we, you know, we sell t-shirts like every band and I kind of like our t-shirts. So, uh, and they're, they're high quality. Um, so are you wearing one right now? Are you wearing one? No, I I can't wear my own t-shirts. That's so embarrassing. (laughs) People are like, Oh, what's that t-shirt? It's like, Oh, it's my band. I've done it before. Like when I like, like, you know, you run out of laundry and you haven't done the laundry and I'll put on my own band t-shirt and I'll like scurry around trying not to let be caught. But, uh, no. So we do that. And, uh, I have a book. Um, it's not close to me. I have a book I made. It's, uh, uh, I do a lot of things. Um, but uh, yeah, so dirtpoorrobins.com or you can just skip over to YouTube and, and watch queen of the night. Uh, it's on our dirt poor Robbins channel. Um, uh, let's know what you think. Tell us you saw us here. So you can give Karen a shout out. Karen, I, I really love your channel. I think that anybody who's tuned in, who wants to hear interesting conversations about someone trying to get to the bottom of things. I think that the meaning code is a great channel. So if you've come here looking for me, follow Karen as well. Oh, that's so kind of you. Thank you so much. This has been an absolute delight. I hope we can talk again, Neil, because I feel like we just scratched the surface. When you said you could go on for 40 hours. <laughs> I swear I could. My friends notes. know. My friends know it's a problem. It's a problem. Well, but, but, I, but you no. have something to say. And uh, well, it. here's the thing. The thing that appealed to me about Jordan Peterson is that he was saying the things that God had been teaching me for 20 years, and he was articulating them in a way that allowed me to maybe get a new perspective on that thing, or just reminded me of a, you know, solidifying the things that God had already taught me. And I feel the same way about you, that when you're talking, as, as you're talking, I'm going, yes, yes, that's exactly it. But there are things that I have not been able to articulate. And so I've ar- tried to articulate those things through my paintings. And um, but you articulate them with words. And so it's just wonderful to listen to you. Well, thank you. Well, I think you're I think you're onto something, too, with, with uh, what you're doing here, too. So I uh, 
you know, give you a high five. I, I felt like when you were describing your process of what you learned about art, it seemed like we had a lot of commonality. So that was exciting to hear because. Uh, well, the, and then when you said the 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 universe is a symphony, I mean that's exactly that's exactly what occurred to me when I started working with this is. Well, of course, that's what appeals. This, of course, this is how we make art. Of course, that's what appeals to us in art is because God is the great maker. He's the great creator. He's the great artist. He's the one who designed the universe and he built these principles into the universe and they show up everywhere. So, of course. Right. And hopefully when people hear us talking, like, because I mean, people are so dismissive of these ideas or they think there's something like if you believe in God, somehow you're bigoted or something like that. And I like the way you're talking on your channel. And I like the conversation we had, because I think we're pointing to something a lot more sophisticated and a lot bigger than people might try to reduce it to. And I think it's a it, it's a people are making a terrible mistake to cut themselves off from uh, from God in that idea, in that capacity. I just think I, I feel bad for them when they do. And I, I wish I could just wave a magic wand and, and help people to see it that way. Cause there's uh there's a lot more meaning out there. Like, you know, in the, there's a lot more meaning out there to be found and that's the food you need. So well, your joy, your joy is infectious, Neil. Well, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah.